Student of the Game is on Patreon. If you'd like to support the channel and become a patron for as little as a dollar a month, click the link below to sign up. Okay, on to the video. I'm going to start this off by telling you two very different stories about Michael Jordan. The first is from 1993, when the Bulls held a promotion at Chicago Stadium where they promised one lucky fan a million dollars if they could make a three-quarter court shot. The fan, a guy named Don Calhoun, actually did make the shot, but when it came time for the Bulls to pay up, it took Michael Jordan and his teammates holding the organization's feet to the fire to actually make that happen. Not only did Jordan personally guarantee that Don Calhoun would get his money and go out of his way in the middle of a championship season to take care of it, but he also signed a basketball for him and his son that Calhoun still has to this day. This story shows, first and foremost, how much Jordan cares about the integrity of a good competition, but also that he has a heart for following through on your word, and for taking care of people that he thinks deserve it. That's the warmer and cuddlier side of Jordan, the one that wouldn't do any media or sign any autographs while he was watching his kids' sports games. But there is another side to him that is probably a little more well known. About two years after Don Calhoun made that shot, in 1995, Jordan had just come back from his two-year hiatus in baseball, much of which was spent in my hometown of Hoover, Alabama, and was trying to bring himself and the Bulls back up to that championship level they'd established before he left. So when Jordan deemed that Steve Kerr wasn't being physical enough in practice, Jordan fouled him so hard that Kerr felt he needed to respond. And Jordan, unsurprisingly, didn't take that very well. He hauls off and hits me in the chest. And I just haul off and hit him right in the f***ing eye. Now, if you're like me, you may be wondering how one person could be the main character in both of those stories. One shows a guy who can be both empathetic and diplomatic in how he resolves conflict, but the other shows the exact opposite of that. And I love Michael Jordan. I was too young to really get to watch him in his prime, but he's still one of my favorite athletes ever. But it's hard to tell which one of these stories shows who this guy really is. Unless, of course, it's actually both. As journalist Michael Wilbon says in The Last Dance, Jordan is the ultimate sports alpha male, a man who, above all else, must be number one in whatever he does, no matter what it costs him personally, which has been kind of a lot over the years. For today's episode, I want to look at three main questions. How did Jordan get like this? What kind of effect has it had on his career? And finally, is this the kind of personality that somebody has to have to be the GOAT? Back in the very earliest phases of the coronavirus lockdown, ESPN released The Last Dance, their long-anticipated documentary about the 90s Bulls that used hours of previously unseen video footage and interviews to show what the team's final run at the title was actually like. And on the whole, that was really cool. Getting to hear about all the various interpersonal dynamics and legendary stories that otherwise might not have made it through an era without Twitter gave the Bulls a much more three-dimensional appeal. We got to better appreciate the contributions and personal journeys of key pieces like Scottie Pippen or Dennis Rodman, or to experience the thoughts of Reggie Miller and Steve Kerr as players, men who we know better these days as a TV analyst or as coach of the Warriors. But we also got a closer look at Michael Jordan, the guy at the center of everything both good and bad about this Bulls team. And the closer you get to MJ, the more complicated things seem. Because behind all the winning and scoring titles and record-breaking endorsement deals, the Last Dance showed that Jordan definitely has a dark side. He can be vindictive and petty and downright mean to people that he sees as a threat, so much so that about halfway through the first episode, I caught myself wondering, is this guy an a I think I better start this off by letting MJ explain all this for himself, which he did in his Hall of Fame acceptance speech back in 2009. I mean, my competitive nature has gone a long way from the first time I picked up any sport. Baseball, football, ran track, basketball, anything to miss class, I played it. You know, that fire started with my parents. And then, you know, as I moved on in my career, people added wood to that fire. Leroy Smith was a guy, when I got cut, he made the team on the varsity team. And he's here tonight. He's still the same 6'7 guy. He's not any bigger. He, his, probably his game is about the same. <laughs> but he started the whole process with me because when he made the team and I didn't, I wanted to prove not just to Leroy Smith, not just to myself, but to the coach who actually picked Leroy over me. I wanted to make sure you understood you made a mistake, dude. <laughs> this little anecdote about Leroy Smith kind of tells you everything you need to know about what makes Michael Jordan tick. 
In case you somehow didn't know this already, Michael Jordan didn't make his varsity basketball team as a sophomore at Laney High School in Wilmington, North Carolina, inspiring the next 40 years of dads and coaches to tell that story to their underachieving sons. But like most origin stories, there's a healthy bit of editorializing happening with this story about Leroy Smith, the guy that was chosen ahead of Jordan to play for Laney's varsity team. Namely, that Michael was about 5'10 at the time, instead of the 6'6 he would eventually grow into, and that Laney very rarely took sophomores to be part of their team at that level. Could they have made an exception for the greatest player of all time? Probably, but that's not the point. The point is that no matter what actually happened, Michael Jordan is not going to let something like nuance or even rationality get in the way of a good beef. That need to silence haters is essential to understanding who Jordan is as a person, and that's been with him since even before he was a sophomore at Laney. Jordan grew up in Wilmington, North Carolina in the late 60s and early 70s. His dad was a mechanic who'd been in the Air Force, and he and Michael's mom, who had become one of the more visible presences in Jordan's later life and eventually be portrayed by Viola Davis in the movie Air, were both incredibly important to Michael's development. The Jordans were hardworking people who just wanted the best for their kids, be that in athletics or education or whatever else they wanted to pursue. If you want to read more about Jordan's upbringing, probably more than you ever thought you wanted to, then I would recommend Roland Lazenby's 2015 biography, Michael Jordan, The Life, which was my primary source for a pretty good chunk of this entire video. Dolores and James Jordan didn't exactly do a whole lot to stifle Michael's drive to dominate other people. They probably didn't think about it that way at the time, but their commitment to both discipline and competition within their family created a challenging environment for each of their five kids. Michael is and always has been very close with his family, but his relationship with his older brother Larry, while largely being very loving and amiable even to this day, was such that bull psychologist George Mumford would later remark that every opponent Michael went up against loomed as a Larry to be conquered. A state of affairs that, once again, was not helped by Michael's parents, especially his dad. James Jordan was a mechanic, a blue-collar guy who'd worked his entire life to grind out a better living for his family in a heavily segregated state. And Michael Jordan's a lot of things, but by all accounts, he is not and was not down to work with his hands for his whole life, and that caused a lot of tension between him and his old man. It may sound a little reductive to attribute Michael Jordan's need to prove himself to daddy issues, but I also don't think it's completely wrong. James Jordan reportedly had a habit of telling a young Michael to go back in the house, the implication being that back there with the women was where he belonged, which, if taken along with experiences like the one with Leroy Smith, could be a pretty important ingredient for creating the most competitive person who's ever lived. But it wouldn't be the last one. Over the course of his career, Jordan was paired with a host of what I would call challenging personalities. From his high school coach Pop Herring to figures with the Bulls like Jerry Krause and Phil Jackson, Jordan was constantly being connected to people who either intentionally or unintentionally put obstacles in front of him, so it's no wonder that he adapted such a sixth sense about getting over them. Dean Smith, his college coach in North Carolina, ran a system that devalued individuals for the sake of the collective, so much so that he benched Michael at one point for being too showy and dunking on an opponent. After blowing a 22-point lead against West Germany in the 84 Olympics, Bob Knight made Jordan apologize to the rest of his team yelling at him and telling him he needed to be embarrassed by how he played, despite being second on the team in scoring in a game that the US ended up winning. Things like this were done to motivate Jordan, to make him better, but in a way that might not be palatable or fun to him. This was the way for that generation, tough love, and it was Michael's reality going all the way back to growing up in Wilmington. And it's hard to argue that that treatment didn't make him better, but man if he didn't internalize all that to the point that it was genuinely difficult for other people to work with him. I have a theory about how Michael Jordan developed once he got to the pros, and it has to do with how we psychologically adjust to our environment. When Jordan entered the league, there was a pretty clear group of elite teams. Magic Johnson's Lakers, Larry Bird's Celtics, and Isaiah Thomas's Bad Boy Pistons. This was a league that was defined by a group of alpha-level teams, each with its own alpha-level star. So to get the Bulls to a position to win, Jordan would have to become something similar. Whereas LeBron James adjusted to competing with teams like the Warriors, Spurs, and Thunder by becoming as efficient and team-oriented as possible, Jordan would have to get the Bulls to the top of the NBA by making himself into the most ruthless, dominant competitor in the league, both physically and psychologically. When teams like the Pistons and Celtics pushed him, Jordan learned to push back. In 1985, as a baby-faced rookie with the Bulls, Jordan made his first of 14 All-Star games, and despite all the team and individual success that would come later, that may have been his most important All-Star weekend of his entire career. Because that year, 
a group of established NBA stars led by Isaiah Thomas and Magic Johnson allegedly instituted what came to be known as a freeze-out of Jordan on the biggest stage of his young NBA career. Angered by Jordan's big endorsement deal with Nike, as well as his ball-dominant, volume-shooting playing style with the Bulls, the group of veterans made a pact to keep Jordan's touches to a minimum, while also working hard to shut him down whenever he did manage to get the ball. This was Jordan's worst nightmare. On a weekend that he'd been dreaming of for years, a group of his childhood heroes were effectively blackballing him so they could teach him a lesson. While Jordan absolutely did fabricate conflicts to motivate himself over the years, like the time he famously invented a beef with Washington guard LeBradford Smith, that all-star game in Indiana was not one of those moments. Not even a full season into his NBA career, Jordan was being tested by the NBA's old guard, setting a clear tone for how his relationships in basketball were going to go from that moment forward. Michael Jordan, the high-flying rookie, was about to transform into the most feared man in the entire NBA, both by opponents and by his own teammates. As the Bulls continued to get bounced out of the playoffs in the late 80s, most notably by Isaiah Thomas's Pistons, which you know Michael didn't enjoy after the freeze-out thing, Jordan began to realize that he couldn't get them to title contention on his own. Bulls management were way ahead of him on this. GM Jerry Krause had been drafting players and hiring coaches that could complement Jordan's MVP-level production for years, but after a third straight loss to the Pistons in 1990, both management and Michael knew that things needed to change. The team began leaning more and more into the triangle offense championed by Phil Jackson and Tex Winter, the coaching tandem that had taken over in Chicago in 1989. This ideological shift meant that Jordan was going to have to start trusting his teammates more than he was used to, but in order to do that, he was going to personally make sure that each and every one of them were up to the task beforehand. Michael Jordan is not an easy man to be on the team with. This gets talked about a lot in both the book and The Last Dance. Punching Steve Kerr in 1995 was one of the more obvious examples of Jordan's harsh treatment of his teammates, but there were plenty more, and they ranged from anything from verbally bullying guys like Bill Cartwright or Rodney McRae to doing truly weird things like reportedly preventing Horace Grant from eating on the team plane after he played a bad game. And this was just how he treated his teammates. He was arguably even worse to the guys he played against. Yeah, let's not get it wrong. He was an a He was a jerk. He crossed the line numerous times. But as time goes on and you think back about what he was actually trying to accomplish, you're like, yeah, he was a hell of a teammate. This is what this whole conversation really comes down to, because as for my original question about whether or not Jordan was an asshole, I think the answer is pretty clearly yes, because here we have a guy who was his teammate for six seasons saying literally exactly that. The real question is whether or not that actually matters, and maybe more importantly, whether or not you have to be an asshole to be the greatest of all time in your sport. Because don't get me wrong, Michael Jordan is absolutely not the only all-time great who's ever behaved like this. I made a video about Tom Brady a while back, and you better believe that guy was pretty brutal on his teammates over the years. But do you have to resort to belittling and intimidating your coworkers to get to that level of excellence? Or is there another way? Winning has a price. And leadership has a price. So I pulled people along when they didn't want to be pulled. I challenge people when they don't want to be challenged. Once you join the team, you live at a certain standard that I played the game, and I wasn't going to take any less. I actually agree with him about playing to a standard, and about leadership and winning both having a price. But I think there's an argument to be made that that price doesn't always have to be paid in the way that Jordan and others like him chose to. I mentioned the Warriors and Spurs earlier. Those teams have eight rings between them, but I don't think I've ever heard any one of those guys described as a tyrant before. We love Leo Messi on this channel. He's a great individual player who's been a leader on some great teams and won a whole bunch of stuff with those teams, but you never hear anything about him destroying any of the guys playing alongside him. In the modern NBA, it's guys like Nikola Jokic and Giannis who are leading the teams that are consistently in a position to win, and they literally could not be more different than the guys from the Dream Team era. The alpha dog model, where one guy is so clearly dominant over the rest of a championship team, seems like it might not even exist that much anymore, and yet there are still great teams and great individual players across sports leagues. There is a generational gap that explains a lot of how we react to stories about Jordan. In many cases, whether you see Jordan's treatment of his teammates as tough love or outright abuse comes down to when you were born, and what you expect from your era's biggest stars. In any case, I would probably argue that while leading your team as an alpha dog may be successful for a while, I don't think it's the most sustainable way to do things. I mean, think about it. 
Jordan ran his own team through intimidation and mind games, and ran everyone else through the exact same process. No one can sustain that level of pettiness forever, including Jordan. By the time he reached 1994, he was so emotionally and mentally burned out that he literally retired. No, before anyone says anything to this effect in the comments, Jordan did not leave basketball because of a secret gambling suspension from the league. But the fact that that's even plausible just kind of helps to prove my point. Jordan's relentless competitiveness was both his greatest personal strength and his greatest weakness. But a solid organizational structure and a talented group of teammates helped the former become more a part of his story than the latter ever did. He spent years barely sleeping, playing constant rounds of golf, and emotionally destroying his opponents and teammates night after night till he himself ran out of gas. He routinely bounced back from poor shooting performances in the first half to dominate games through sheer will in the second. And while that kind of thing plays well when things are going well, like they did in Chicago, it doesn't when that environment is no longer there. When he was an executive turned player with the Wizards in the early 2000s, Jordan actually played pretty well, but was continually frustrated by the mediocrity he saw himself surrounded by. He handled that the way he always had, by testing his teammates' limits, including those of his former number one overall choice center, Kwame Brown, who, by all accounts, he was absolutely ruthless to. Brown never lived up to his potential, and Jordan was out of Washington within three years. As a player, Jordan had a mental makeup unlike anything the league had seen before or since. He had a unique ability to be present in the moment, to focus on what he could control and not worry about failure, and that single-minded focus enabled him to win everything there was to win in the sport. But it also might have prevented him from seeing the bigger picture behind his actions, something that, based on his justification of all that in The Last Dance, he still may not fully understand. He is not remotely apologetic about how he treated his teammates, because in his mind, why would he be? Jordan got so much positive reinforcement from winning and making money and just the public's adoration that there was never an incentive for him to change his ways, and there's no real incentive for him to do that now either. How you respond to his behavior relative to what he accomplished will almost certainly determine what you think of him as a whole. But no matter where you land on that, or whether or not you think he was the greatest player ever, I think a few things about Jordan are inarguable. First, Jordan purposely put his teams through hell so they could all reach the promised land together. The reality of that is tough to consume, no matter whether or not you think the end justifies the means. But also, Jordan wasn't and isn't necessarily a bad guy, and shouldn't be remembered as such. People are complicated and contain multitudes, so maybe their legacies should reflect that. But between the fame, the dominance, the berating of teammates, and the role he occupied as the center of the basketball world for a while, I think it's fair to say that the players, coaches, and staffs of the NBA would have a very hard time handling another Michael Jordan. Truth be told, they barely made it work with the first one. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching the video. My name is Will, and this is my channel, Student of the Game, where we talk about sports psychology and culture. This one had a pretty healthy dose of both, and I know that talking about Michael Jordan brings out some pretty strong takes, so if you have an opinion about the episode or about anything I didn't cover on the topic, please do go ahead and put it in the comments. I do read those pretty regularly and do my best to respond, but while you're spending more time on the channel, you might as well go ahead and like the video and subscribe. Both of those make a huge difference in growing our community, which is kind of the whole reason I do this. And that all together does more than you probably realize towards making a better sports conversation. Till next time though, I'm Will. See you later.